Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Responsible Wool Standard 2.0 and Responsible Mohair Standard 1.0 launch. Today's presentation will be recorded and sent out to all registered participants and will also be posted on the Hub. We will have a Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box on the webinar doc. Any unanswered questions will be answered afterward via email. Now on to our presenters. Let me introduce to you our Textile Exchange team members, Hannah Deans, Senior Manager of Standards, and Callie Weldon, Standards Coordinator. Also presenting today, we have Peter Burston, who is the Senior Principal Ecologist with Biodiversity Consultancy, and Anna Heaton, who is an Independent Animal Welfare Consultant. Now I will turn it over to Hannah. Thank you, Rose, and thank you to all the participants who have joined. Uh, so the agenda for today's webinar is that we're going to start off with taking a look at the development and revision process that we have just completed. We're also going to review the transition policy as we shift from RWS 1.0 to 2.0 and the uh, updates to the rules around logos and labeling claims. And after that, we're going to take a closer look at the standards to see what has changed in the, in the RWS uh, and also what the uh, responsible mohair standard covers and how the two work together. We will review this section by section. And uh, when we get to, to the end of, of this content, we will pause and take questions. But as Rose said, uh, any questions that uh, you have as we go through, feel free to start um, posting this in the, in the chat function. But before we start, I would just like to say thank you. Thank you very much to our international working group members who have been working very hard over the past few months to help us complete this process. But also thank you to all the stakeholders that have given us uh, really thorough feedback to really help improve these standards and make them the, the best tools they, they can be. And also to all the, the users of the, um, of the responsible wool standard and the uh, new potential users of the responsible mohair standard for their engagement in the process. Without this input and support, uh, it wouldn't have been possible. So thank you. So uh, we'll start off with reviewing the process and it, I think it's helpful to just give a little bit of, of context to how we work as a standards organization. Textile Exchange is now a full member of ICL. This means that we follow their codes of good practice for standard setting as well as uh, impact and assurance. Um, for those that are interested in taking a closer look at our procedures, they're available on our, on our website and I've included a link here. Um, we will talk a little bit more when we come to the animal welfare section about how the MOHA standard and the wool standard work together. But um, just uh, in terms of the, the development process, we started the work on developing the responsible MOHA standard in the summer of 2018. And we initiated that with uh, research and stakeholder consultation. And around the same time, we started the process of preparing for the RWS revision. We have a commitment to regularly revise our standards and the RWS was released in 2016, so we knew that uh, a revision would be, would be upcoming. Uh, we held two big public stakeholder consultations in preparation for the revision. And this feedback, along with the research on Mohair, was used to create uh, the work plan for the revision. So that's how we developed their call schedule as well as the, um, the portfolio of issues papers. And uh, this will be familiar to those that were involved in the international working group. This was uh, our initial, initial call schedule. So we, uh, we have been, um, uh, had quite an intensive timetable where we have reviewed each section of the standard topic by topic and the process we followed has been uh, uh, looking at um, each, each section of the standard in turn and inviting feedback on the proposed changes and then uh, refining the drafts as we've gone along. 
Uh, this series, of course, took us up to the Textile Exchange Conference in Vancouver, where we also had an in-person meeting at the uh, Responsible Wool uh, Roundtable meeting, uh, where we finalized the drafts that went out for the public stakeholder consultation in November. And the process following that has been an iterative process of processing the feedback that came in from the public stakeholder consultation. That was a 60 day period. We processed all that feedback and reviewed it with the International Working Group. And we held a series of calls and sent out different, different versions of, of the drafts, which then brought us up to the, uh, um, the public release last week. Um, so we try and uh, work as far as possible um, uh, on a consensus based decision making approach, but we, the final draft is decided on um, with a vote. To be a member of the International Working Group, if you sign a charter, you have a vote. We then apportion the vote between the different uh, stakeholder categories. And you can see here listed on the slide the following sectors are the, the different stakeholder categories where the votes are allocated between. With the RWS and the RMS, we did combine material producers and supply chain into, into one category. Um, we, one of the aims of our um, stakeholder engagement as well is that we have a balanced representation between different stakeholder categories in our international working groups. Uh, so what you can see on the slide here is based on the signed charters and I'll just uh, note here that the signed charters is just a small proportion of the broader international working group. There were uh, and the broader stakeholder community that have um, inputted into the development and the revision process, but these were the, the members who signed up uh, to vote. And uh, we have a, a, a balanced spread between the end users of the standards, the brands and retailers, and the, the raw material producers and first stage processors. Um, our standard setting procedures also requires us to achieve a participation goal. We need to achieve a quorum of 75% representation within each stakeholder category for the vote. And we, we achieved this with a clear margin for the voting process. And um, the, the result of the vote was also a, a, very, a very clear vote in favor of both the, the RWS and, and RMS. Uh, we did combine the, the votes in the charter, so we had a couple of abstentions from the RMS from participants that are not uh, using Mohair at all. Upon the release of the, uh, re the Responsible Wall Standard version 2 and the Responsible Mohair Standard, we are also introducing a new name which is the responsible animal fiber standard this is something that is helping us combine the standards in the assurance system to make adoption as easy as possible for the supply chain so key points to note is that at the farm level there are still separate scope certificates for the responsible wool standard and the responsible mohair standard However, a farm or a group may hold both. There is only one textile exchange site fee, even if both scopes are applied. And we are also allowing for remote audits to speed up the RMS certification in 2020 for farms that are already certified to the responsible wool standard. In the supply chain, the change is bigger. The scope certificates there become responsible animal fiber scope certificates. This has happened by 2021, so it will replace the RWS scope certificates as, um, as they are reissued. Um, sorry. Um, and facilities that are certified to the responsible animal fiber standard in the supply chain can produce both RWS and RMS products. 
And this is also intended to ensure that there is an easy transition if in the future we add other animal fiber standards to our system. And for those suppliers that are currently certified to the responsible wool standard, uh, they can now start adding responsible mohair standard products to their scope certificate. Which brings me then on to logos and labeling and claims. So can I just uh, show the, the logos? We are keeping the, the logos very, very similar looking. So we've uh, updated it with a, a image reflecting the Angora goat that grows mohair. And we had a lot of discussion in the international working group around how to approach the labeling policies, uh, reflecting the fact that considering that we are combining the standards in the in the supply chain. However, the decision is made that for the time being, we are keeping the claims completely separate. Uh, this is something that we will review in future revisions of the standard or as we review the textile exchange claims framework. But for the time being, an RWS certified product may contain non RMS mohair, but it can't contain non RWS wool. And the same goes for an RMS product. This may contain non RWS wool, but it may not contain non RWS mohair. The desire of the International Working Group is to move in the future towards combined claims, but we are recognizing that in the current um, supply, this is not a, a realistic expect expectation, so uh, we are keeping the claims separate for now. And. Um, we have issued a logo use and claims guide for the responsible mohair standard, and we have updated the responsible wool standard logo use and claims guide to reflect um, the responsible animal fibers uh, policy. These guidance manuals are available on, uh, on the website. So the, the only change is the addition of a reference to the responsible animal fiber uh, standard and um, we are working on a uh, claims framework review at Textile Exchange. So this may have an impact on uh, our approach in the future. And for those that are, that are interested, please do, do get in touch to uh, give feedback and be involved. Right, so that's the, uh, the process and the uh, policy framework, uh, which then brings me on to the, the the really interesting thing that the standards themselves and um, the standard documents are now accompanied by a user manual document uh, which is a really key point to be aware of with rws version one we had uh, a number of supporting documents we had a farmer guidebook and an implementation manual as well as auditor guidance. Uh, we have now replaced these three different documents with one user manual, which gives guidance on compliance. It also provides additional good practice information relating to the requirement, as well as uh, guidance notes uh, more broadly on topics covered by the standard. And it also provides uh, templates uh, for the plans and records that the standard requires. And our intention is to keep this a fairly live document that we update on an ongoing basis as uh, new interpretation is uh, made and new resources are, are developed. All right, so I shall hand over to Anna now, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the animal welfare portion of the standard and uh, how um, the, the key changes that have happened there. Thanks, Hannah. That's great. Um, so this this is really just uh, starting off with a very sort of uh, high level um, overview, but it, it's still a something to consider in, in the way that the uh, the RWS version two and RMS version one were created. 
I'm sure you are all familiar with the five freedoms as they are listed here. It's a very common reference point for uh, development of standards and a way of uh, looking at whether uh, whatever framework you create does actually meet the key topics of animal welfare. Uh, and as I say, freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury or disease, freedom to express normal behaviour and freedom from fear and distress. Um, but if we can go to the uh, next slide, uh, the sort of the way that thinking about animal welfare and uh, understanding animal welfare has moved on since the five freedoms were first proposed and what we're looking at now when we're considering animal welfare standards is the five provisions and you will see that there are some uh, similarities in the uh, points that are that are, uh, are being made but it's some of this is about uh, framing the conversation slightly differently from talking about the um, five freedoms and also uh, at the point five here, this sort of positive mental experiences is rather than saying the animal must not be so with the five freedoms, it's freedom from pain and distress. This is more about this has to be uh, creating something that delivers a positive outcome, not just an absence of negatives. Um, and I think the next slide gives, yeah, so it then sort of within the provisions is then what are the animal welfare aims that will uh, deliver on each of these uh, provisions and and it's this again this is a sort of high level view of when we were developing the animal welfare framework on which both RWS version 2 and RMS version 1 uh, are built from it was having these um, these these aims and these desired outcomes to come from each of uh, each of the the key modules within within the standards so if you have the next slide so um, as is shown here we've got key um, the modules are shown down the left hand side in the first column the desired outcomes which are taking us back to delivering on the uh, the five provisions and then the, the categories and, and topics within within each of those but I'm, I'm not going to run through this in in great detail this is really just to say give that that high level um, point about how how this has been developed and uh, what the key aims were for the for the outcomes um, so the next slide um, and here's yeah so here's a, a sort of specific examples of how the framework has been used and also to give this this also shows that we have um, a lot of similarity between a responsible wool standard and the uh, responsible mohair standard where that is appropriate but sometimes just the language might might change there are some standards that are very specific to or some requirements that are very specific to sheep such as things like tail docking um, that are not applicable to goats and we handle that as well but it all fits into this uh, framework um, which was the the idea of it that even though there might be some very specifics that are only relevant for one species other than rather than the other um, the framework gives us this model that we can say we are ensuring that we're delivering on these um, uh, welfare outcomes under the under the five provisions thanks next one but this now gets into a bit more of the, uh, the sort of nitty gritty of it to sort of say, well, what are the things what, uh, that we have changed as we've been um, developing the version two of the responsible wool standard? And then uh, obviously those, those sort of updates, if you like, or amendments are then reflected in the um, responsible mohair standard as well. So under nutrition, our key aim is this access to sufficient food and water that's suited to the animal's age and needs because uh, during different phases of the farming year or the production cycle the uh, requirements of an individual animal will will vary uh, to maintain normal health and to prevent prolonged hunger thirst malnutrition or dehydration so with one thing we've removed a requirement to keep records of body condition score monitoring because 
what we're really interested in is are these animals being maintained in a state of good health and welfare when it comes to nutrition so what we're looking at is what happens when people record that body condition score is below the levels that uh, are shown in the standards as being uh, acceptable and and what actions were then taken to restore return the animals to good health so it was moving away from a requirement that was just about record keeping and moving more to actions to maintain um, good nutrition and, and good health that comes from, from that. And then we have uh, standards around deprivation periods for a removal from food and water. This is generally really talking about pre-shearing. Uh, and we had quite a lot of conversation on the various uh, working group calls that I'm sure some of you will remember about how we make sure we're protecting um, animal welfare during those periods of, of deprivation uh, and particularly for those animals that are in late pregnancy who uh, will suffer uh, more distress if they're removed from water for food and water for too long so it's just sort of making sure that we are being clear about not not just saying you can take animals off feed and water for X number of hours, but that if there are signs of, for example, heat stress um, from being removed from water, it's requiring the certified farm to take, act, take some remedial action about this as well. So again, it was sort of uh, expanding the requirements to protect welfare. Um, the next slide, please. And then living environment. So, um, so we, this was about keeping animals in an environment that provides the conditions and facilities for health, safety, comfort, and normal behaviour. One of the really big uh, changes here was the um, in the scope of the previous uh, the first version one for responsible wool standard the scope said that this should be a pasture based activity but actually we've now moved this into the standard so it's very very clear and it can be scored at uh, at audit that that this is defining a uh, pasture based pasture rangeland animals being outside uh, and uh, and getting the opportunity to graze um, within within the requirements so it's the same for the uh for the responsible mohair standard and the responsible uh, wool standard that this is now requiring access to to natural pasture at all times unless there's emergency or severe weather conditions would would impact on the welfare so it, it does still allow farmers to bring their animals into shelter if needed but it's basically saying what we're certifying it the, the system is about them the animals being outside as uh, as much as as possible um we all also uh, added some additional requirements around uh, thermal comfort, natural light, uh, avoidance of noise that uh, could cause distress and uh, protection from uh, predators. And we had uh, we've got a standard about if animals are removed from pasture, um, then uh, they should have sufficient space for them all to move around. And we've now also added a recommendation that says, well, this is how much space we think there needs to be for each different type uh, of animal. So again, there's just more information on on what's expected from the from the farmer. Uh, and the next one, please. And then animal management. So this has probably got the um, the most sort of uh, updates and uh, amendments in this section. So this was sort of animal management covers a lot of things. Uh, so it's all about sort of husbandry operations uh, to promote good health, prevent disease, uh, make sure the sick or injured animals are treated and husbandry operations are carried out in a way that minimises pain and distress. Uh, one of the key ones here uh, for the responsible wool standing standard is something we've, we've always had that uh, mulesing is prohibited. But with the um, advent of some uh, techniques for uh, removing um, uh, the skin that bears wool around the breech of the sheep coming through, we want to be really, really clear in this version of the responsible wool standard that any modification uh, in, in the breech area where we're removing skin is 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 not permitted so we very clearly said the sort of the freeze mulesing or steining that falls under our definition of prohibited mulesing prohibited activity so uh, again this hasn't changed but it's just giving clarification there 
Um, we've also done quite a lot of work with this time around with pain relief and this has been I feel this has been quite a positive story that um, uh, when the responsible wool standard was first being developed there really just weren't uh, that many products around that uh, were licensed for use uh, and, and it, this is a changing uh, situation where more products are coming to market not necessarily in all regions of the world right now but it's it's a it's a very positive trend that we're moving in this direction so for the responsible wool standard and responsible mohair standard we're basically uh, giving clarification on when pain relief needs to be used uh, and defining uh, when it's reasonable to expect a farmer to use the product uh, and basically what we're saying is, you know, anything painful is being done to the animal, then if pain relief is available, then it needs to be used. But we've then been clear that this available means something that the farmer can access without having to get a, a vet on farm every time they uh, castrate a lamb, for example. Um, but what we've done as well with the user guide, and as Hannah mentioned, this really sort of comes back into saying that the user guide will be, uh, you know, quite a live document, is we have actually uh, listed products that, uh, that can be used for pain relief, uh, what they're suitable for, which husbandry operations they're suitable for, and which countries they are, are, they are licensed in. And that's something that we've committed to keep um, updated. But again, so this is a, sort of a, a, a new and sort of emerging uh, area of, of, uh, of work. Um, on inspection frequency, we know that uh, having said that all these systems are pasture based, we know that within that you've got quite a, a range in what uh, the farm size, topography, uh, climate, all these kind of things might be. Uh, and so with inspection frequency, we have provided guidance on how often uh, sheep sh need to be inspected to ensure that their welfare is protected and given some idea of you know what are the uh, uh the key outcomes that might show that inspection is not frequent enough so uh, rather than being very prescriptive and trying to write a standard that says for example everybody must check every sheep once a day which we know uh, isn't actually feasible in some of the um, the uh, flocks and herds that we're we're looking at just for the size of the operation operation. Uh, it's much more done on the welfare outcome that we are still protecting welfare but we are giving the farms some flexibility in how they actually um, deliver that. Then with um, identification, uh, we've again we've done some cl some clarity here on what's permitted like for example saying that tattooing was is, is allowed. There was also quite a lot of conversation about um, ear notching, actually cutting uh, a piece out of the animal's ear in order to show identification uh, to a particular flock or herd. And uh, what we've done with that is we've set some requirements around notching when this is used. We understand from the input that we've had that there are legitimate reasons for wishing to use notching as a form of identification. Um, but what we've done is said, OK, well, if, if we're going to allow this, then it needs to be done under a set prescription. So that's what's been set into the uh, standards. Um, on shearing, uh, again, these are sort of almost, this is not major changes from the previous responsible wool standard, but just making sure that we've got this clarity that there needs to be supervision by somebody that is competent when uh, shearing is, is taking place. And then this planning, pre-shearing planning for climatic conditions, which sort of slightly overlaps with the, uh, the living environment when we're talking about there, what's happening when you're withdrawing sheep from uh, feed and water and where are sheep when they're uh, waiting to be uh, sheared uh, and what planning is is reasonable to expect um, to prepare for uh, climatic conditions some of this is coming from the fact we are we are seeing a lot of uh, changing weather patterns uh, in in the world and also the fact that shearing which for some people still is uh, an annual operation always taking place at the same time of year we're seeing people moving to perhaps um, eight month shearing intervals which starts meaning that you might be shearing at times of year uh, when this wasn't traditionally carried out so it's just making sure again we're coming back to the the welfare as the sheep is is protected 
Uh, on the access to milk point, this is just setting a, a minimum requirement for lambs to be to get milk, and this applies to whether this is a lamb that's suckling on its mother, or if it's a lamb that's being uh, that might have been orphaned, for example, um, that's being artificially reared on milk. But just setting that baseline uh, in there. Artificial breeding procedures, again, this is sort of additional requirements. We had quite a lot of conversation on the uh, working groups about um, uh, things like uh, laparoscopic artificial insemination. Again, what we've done is just set more prescriptions around this, make sure that uh, pain relief is being used uh, for some of these, uh, these, uh, these operations and just being much clearer about what's expected to protect welfare. And then on euthanasia, this is another piece that will be within the user guide that will be updated as, um, as necessary, but giving uh, a lot more information on what products are available when it comes to captive uh, bolt guns, uh, which companies are making these and which countries um, the products are available in. So again, this is hopefully signposting people uh, to the correct equipment that can be used in order to um, meet the standard. Uh, that's great. The next one, um, handling and transport. There's uh, th this is there's probably uh, less in this one, but um, uh, good animal well human animal human animal relationships in place animals are handled transported around the farm and off the farm in a way that protects welfare so we've got more sort of movement towards uh, visual and audible handling aids uh, rather than physical handling requirements for contingency planning when doing transport uh, uh, as well looking at um, in this has come into the handling section sort of livestock guardian animal suitability uh, we know that livestock guardian animals are an incredibly useful tool in some geographies for predator protection uh, but it's just then making sure that those animals are are protected as well that we're using the right animal for the predators that are there uh, and that the right animal in the right environment again there's probably the key uh, change in this section is uh, a prohibition on live export and I know there's been quite a lot of uh, discussion about what this actually uh, means and what we've said the the standard we have says that the, the certified farm cannot knowingly sell sheep direct to live export and that's really the 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 point there is is that if a farm for example sells sheep through auction then they have no idea who's going to buy those animals and we have no idea who's going to buy those animals and if you're sending through auction you can't say oh i only want these people to buy my animals i don't want those people to buy my animals so if if that happens that uh, somebody sent uh, the animals to auction and they then ended up in live export that's not knowingly selling direct to live export but if you sell to to, uh, a farm sells direct to somebody who is saying I am advertising I specifically want sheep that I am going to export live to another country uh, then that's where it starts to become a, a problem and we have provided guidance on this in the user guide as well and there's a couple of um, uh, minor exemptions for example uh, if it's going by road um, it, it, within the transport standards to an adjoining country if you're literally crossing borders because you we we certainly know we get that in 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 well quite a few countries around the world that you may get those kind of situations this this isn't what this was designed to uh to stop if you like um but this is this topic is coming up as a a, a really big uh welfare issue uh, so we just wanted to have a sort of clear line in the sand to say this is not uh, live export is not something that responsible wool standard or the responsible mohair standard support. Uh, and the next one, uh, management plans and procedures. So again, parallel production, the prohibition on parallel production, i.e. you cannot have a flock of certified sheep alongside a flock of non-certified sheep or a flock of certified goats alongside a, a herd of non-certified goats on the same farm. Again, this was in the scope and is now clearly a, a standard and a requirement just to make it really clear that that's what we're expecting. And also in this management plans and procedures, we've got some new requirements requiring quarantine against sort of the best practice when new animals are coming onto the farm. And the next one, uh, 
And then this is the last one for, for me. We now have this optional slaughter module. Uh, and this one again has raised some questions to just to really get some uh, uh, clarity here that this, um, this, there's no requirement for a certified farm to have to get uh, the site where they send lambs for so slaughter certified. Uh, it is a, it's, it's, it's an optional extra. Um, it, it may be useful, the reason it was developed is we were getting asked about, for example, the skins of sheep or goats that were coming from uh, certified farms uh, and whether there could be any claim attached to those. So uh, what we're saying is that this, um, the use of the responsible wool standard or responsible mohair standard would not be permitted. But uh, if the farm is certified and the slaughter site is certified, then for non-food products like skins, uh, then they might be able to make claims about the origin of the byproducts in text when they were talking about these particular products. And again, as is noted here, chain of custody custody requirements are applied to ensure that the skins that might be being sold with some additional text saying that they came from responsible wool standard or responsible mohair standard farms I would have to be there would have to be a chain of custody to show that they, they these really were the same skins that came from those sheep or, or goats and the slaughter module is again really uh, about uh, the process prevents or minimizes pain and distress and it does have a requirement that all animals must be stunned prior to the slaughter within with, uh, as part of the the process um, so that's a, a a quick run through some of the key changes for the animal welfare sectors and of course um, i'll be happy to take any questions as they come up once we've gone through everything else thanks hannah great thank you very much uh, anna that was a, a whirlwind tour of the animal welfare part of the the standard and um, i'm sure everyone can appreciate this there's, there's a lot of detail there so we've kept it quite high level but for those that are interested in really digging into into the detail we, we have got uh, uh, a full breakdown of all, all the changes that's available for review as well but i shall move over to land management now and um, by way of uh, Sort of introduction to the changes there is uh, something that applies across the standard um, is that we are introducing recommendations so both in the animal welfare section and land management and in social we now have recommendations for those that are looking really closely you will have noticed that the the non-conformity levels look a little bit different in rws V1, we had NC1, 2, and 3. But across all textile exchange standards, we have now introduced a consistent approach to non conformity levels. So we now have the critical, major, and minus, and recommendations in all of our standards. And because of this introduction of recommendations, uh, we felt that it would make it a little bit simpler to adjust the continual improvement model we had for land management, where in the past we required 50% compliance with the minor requirements in year one. Um, we have adjusted it and introduced more recommendations and we have also allowed for a longer compliance timeline for land management minor requirements. So there's still the element of continual improvement in this module, but um, it's uh, not too many, not too many variations, and a little bit easier system to to manage um, uh, and calibrate. And uh, like with the animal welfare section um, of the standard, a big big part of the revision here has really been about providing more detail and clarification on the, on the existing requirements and to develop out the, the user manual with more, more content. And uh, we've had some, uh, some fantastic support from the biodiversity consultancy in, in doing this. So I will hand over to, to Peter Burstyn now, who will tell us a little bit more about some of the key changes in the, in the land management part of the standards. Um, thanks, Hannah. Um, just for a very brief introduction um, or background to the changes, um, 
in addition to sort of reviewing the uh, the wording of the existing standards, uh, we conducted a quite a detailed benchmarking process where we compared the responsible wall standard with 12 other um, standards uh, just to make sure that um, the responsible wall standard was comparable and also to identify sort of key gaps that may well have occurred. Um, we reviewed um, all the land management uh, prints, uh, the, the criteria, um, although a large part of that was focusing on, on biodiversity. Uh, we did briefly look at the, the soil and fertilizer and, and pesticide uh, criteria as well. Um, but most of the, the changes that I'll go through uh, relate to, to biodiversity. Um, the first one I'll mention is, um, uh, is around soil erosion. And this is sort of one of the themes that, that run through some of the changes that have been made is the, the focus on um, water bodies. So that includes sort of rivers, lakes, wetlands. And it's a recognition that um, the impacts to uh, the impacts of land management don't just occur actually on the farm uh, or limited to, to the farm itself, but um, some of the key key impacts actually occur <coughs> off the <coughs> excuse me <coughs> off farm when um, things like um, sediment fertilizer pesticides run off the area of the f controlled by the farmer into to uh, a river and runs downstream. Um, so there's a fairly minor change to the soil erosion criteria that um, focuses on water bodies where sediment might be running off into those water bodies. And there's a sort of a more explicit requirement um, to, to assess potential risks to, to water bodies and then to implement uh, control measures to try and avoid those, those impacts. And there's a sort of suggestions as to the types of control measures that, that could be implemented. Then in terms of biodiversity, uh, one of the key new requirements, um, and this is fairly central um, to delivery of, of the responsible wall standards for, for biodiversity, is the requirement now to develop a biodiversity management plan. Um, and this is um, pretty universal for um, all equivalent standards um, like a responsible wall standard to the requirement to have a management plan. Um, and one of the sort of central elements of the plan itself is then a, a, a map of the farm. So the farmer uh, is required to uh, produce a, a map of the farm. And the main, um, uh, one of the main um, objectives of the map is, of course, you know, unless you know what biodiversity you have on the farm and where that biodiversity is, is within the farm, then it's very difficult to um, to avoid um, impacts to those those biodiversity features or indeed uh, implement requirement uh, implement actions to um, to to conserve and, and to protect and enhance those. Um, so the 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 map it requires um, the the key biodiversity features to be to be identified and that's very much focusing on uh, natural habitats that might occur on the farm and then key species so whether there's uh, threatened endemic uh, or or keystone species that the farmer knows um, that occurs on the farm and there's um, sources of information. Um, Within the guidance that um, sort of points uh, towards resources where which can help farmers to identify those things. Um, as with um, any good management plan, um, there's a requirement to identify specific actions that the farmer is uh, committing to to implement, and those actions. Uh, sort of fall within conserving habitats or, or species, restoring them, or then enhancing. So it's not just about avoiding negative impacts, but there's, and this is sort of another sort of a, a, almost like a themic change to the, 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 the wording in the requirement. It's not just trying to avoid the, the bad things, but it's actually putting an impetus to, um, uh, to 
put those positive actions to actually provide a, a biodiversity enhancement. And those actions should be time bound. Um, and there's sort of a, an annual and a, a five year um, suggested review cycle to, to that management plan. And if all that seems an awful lot for a, a farmer to um, take on, then in the updated guidance, there's now a, a template for a, a biodiversity management plan, recognizing that this needs to be uh, implementable in a wide range of geographies and, and landscapes. Um, so the, the template is uh, hopefully um, universally applicable. Um, and there's an encouragement also for the farmer to seek advice if, if at all possible. So in many areas, there's local NGOs or, or advisors, good advisors that can provide advice and help to draw up uh, that sort of plan. If they're not, if they don't feel that they have their own, you know, the, the expertise themselves, then there's an encouragement to reach out. Um, Hannah, I think if you could move forward, thank you. Um, So here's a list of um, sort of the other main changes that have taken place. Some of them are, are relatively minor. Um, there's a little bit of consolidation, particularly around grazing management. Um, and in terms of the grazing management, I think one of the main changing changes is is to actually just provide a stated objective. So the original uh, wording said that forage resources would be monitored and managed, but it didn't specify what the purpose of that was. Um, so additional detail has been put in that, that the you know, explicit objectives are to protect, to restore and enhance biodiversity values on the farm. Um, and one of the sort of key mechanisms for that is through stocking rates and grazing management. Uh, so avoiding negative impacts from overgrazing, compaction, erosion, and that sort of thing. But then also, as I say, that sort of themic change to, um, to, to focus on also then the, the encouraging um, uh, the positive actions uh, that can be, uh, that can result from um, grazing natural ecosystems is, you know, grazing systems is um, often being done in a very responsible way and in a, a way that actually is helping to conserve and promote natural ecosystems. Um, so it's it's reflecting that. Um, in relation to invasive species, there's um, not a huge amount of changes, really an additional um, detail added to the existing requirement to, to monitor and manage um, invasive species. One of the, probably the main addition there is that it uh, doesn't just cover plants now, but it's also um, invasive animals as well, so both flora and fauna. Um, the the wording is now hopefully a little bit more explicit, is a bit more in line with other similar standards, and uh, it goes into a little bit more detail. So, um, so managing um, invasive species doesn't. What does that mean? Well, it means avoiding introduction of invasive species. It involves of the spreading that spreading if they have been introduced in the past avoid spreading them around the farm further and then also requirements to try and eradicate them if they are present as well uh, in relation to um, livestock wildlife conflicts the, the key change there is to um, place a focus on the need to avoid um, wildlife um, livestock uh, conflict in the first place there is an explicit requirement to be proactive in in that respect um, I think that's a key change sort of in terms of the, um, uh, uh, the standard to you know in terms of um, if if lethal control is to take place for for predators then there really has to be you know quite a, a, a reasonable justification um, an evidence base for that. Um, land use change and deforestation, this is quite a significant uh, tightening um, of the standard. So there was a very clear requirement beforehand to, um, in terms of, uh, to prohibit deforestation for conversion to agriculture. So the, the, the key additional 
uh, requirement there is that that now includes not just um, uh, removal of forests, but also other natural conversion of other natural ecosystems. Um, so, you know, this um, reflects the fact in many landscapes uh, there may be relatively low forest uh, cover, um, and actually the the main biodiversity losses is occurring from non-forest habitats, conversion of non-forest habitats, and actually they, in some of those landscapes, those non-forest habitats are where the higher biodiversity values are. Uh, and potentially easier to convert to agriculture. Um, and that sort of brings the RWS in line with other standards, um, several other standards that has that requirement. And to make um, any sort of deforestation or, or land use conversion requirement um, robust, it needs to include a cutoff date um, after which time uh, um, uh, the, that that activity is not allowed so there's a, a cutoff date of 2016 included in the requirement now uh, and then just a couple more um, there is a new requirement in relation to protected areas and key biodiversity areas um, this again is pretty universal in most other standards and it reflects the fact that nationally protected areas but also key biodiversity areas and those include things like important bird areas alliance of zero extinction sites ramsar sites you know those are designated according to global international um, criteria that identify these areas as key areas globally that support important concentrations of biodiversity globally so if a farm is operating and it's situated within one of these areas then a, the farmer needs to know about it, um, and that needs to be recorded in the, the biodiversity management plan. Uh, and they need to understand what the, um, the biodiversity features that have triggered that designation. It doesn't mean to say um, that those actually occur on the farm itself, because many designations, you know, they, they might include a larger area. Um, but if they are on the farm and they're supported by natural ecosystems uh, on the farm, then it's really crucial that farmers understand that and they don't um, um, operate in a way that degrades or, um, or uh, impacts on those biodiversity values of why those protected areas are, have been designated. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, there's this sort of theme of, of protecting wetlands and water courses. Um, this is fairly universal in several other standards um, and not only are water bodies um, important for uh, biodiversity in their own right but often they're very important from uh, broader ecosystem services so um, you know humans are pretty reliant on uh, water for, for drinking water but also ecosystem services in terms of things like flood prevention so if sediment um, goes into to water courses then um, you know that can reduce their capacity to to hold flood waters downstream so there's a range of sort of explicit requirements there to help protect aquatic ecosystems river banks um, uh, and sort of measures to help protect those so whether that's buffer zones or or um, uh, protection of riparian areas uh, and I've pretty much covered fertilizers and pesticides um, as uh, as part of all of that so i think that's that's a very quick run through all the all the changes so i'll hand back to hannah but of course I'm very happy to answer questions if there are any great thank you very much peter and um yeah i would uh, encourage everyone to have a look at the uh, the land management section of the of the user guide because that's definitely an area where there has been a lot, a lot of work has, has gone into that. And um, whilst the standard itself does not look drastically, drastically different, hopefully it is uh, better, better organized and much clearer. And um, as Peter said, uh, the, um, the landscaping and benchmarking exercise comparing the RWS against, against other standards in some of these changes will uh, have been uh, helpful in terms of getting that alignment um, and the, um, strengthening the, the RWS. Uh, so I'm conscious of time and we haven't got, got very much uh, longer for this webinar, but I will give a, a very quick overview of the social uh, welfare section. 
So for as, as background, it was a, um, a very strong theme in the feedback from stakeholders over a long period of time that uh, there was a, a sense that we needed to start addressing social welfare as well in the, in the standard. Uh, we recognize that this is something that is a little bit outside of, of our area of expertise, the only one of textile exchange standards that, that does address social criteria is the, the DRS, and that's in the, in the supply chain. But the process that we have gone through is that similar to, to the approach with, with land, we, um, we commissioned a consultancy to conduct a landscape assessment of other social assurance schemes in the um, uh, in the world of, of agriculture and then based on that they created a framework which consisted of a set of desired outcomes and a very very comprehensive set of requirements which then um, gave us a starting point for uh, stakeholder consultation both on the the content of the standard as well as the approach um, so what we've what we've arrived at is a set of baseline core criteria along with a set of recommendations and then we are working on developing additional user resources so that we will have template policies and procedures in a similar way that we do for animal welfare and land management um, so the uh, social welfare module of the standard is, uh, addresses a number of categories and um, like with animal welfare and land management, each section is framed by a desired outcome below which sits uh, the, the requirements and the recommendations. So this gives a, a good sort of north star of what the, the intent of, of the standard is and the, the direction of travel. Um, it is um, aligned with ILO and uh, it also relies on um, uh, re makes reference to, to national legislation and that it is definitely a starting point for for the standard so it isn't um, a, a, a detailed very thorough social compliance standard but it, it is a starting point addressing some of those core criteria in relation to forced labor, child labor, as well as health and safety, and then introducing a, a set of, of requirements. And uh, as I mentioned, we will work on making the um, user manual, um, providing more content there. And then we are also uh, listening to, to feedback and we will be looking at how, how the adoption of this goes and um, already starting to prepare for for the next revision really that's uh i guess the, the revision period starts the day after you release a standard and one uh, one final note for those that have been following the process you'll be aware that we are also working on creating a module that is applicable in a herding context this is a project that's been ongoing for some time um amish our uh, um manager in India has been conducting field studies on the India farming system and supply chains and we have got an adapted version of the RWS that has been developed both in terms of uh, adjustments to the requirements as well as to the approach in terms of the assurance system. We are currently planning for pilot audits with um, uh, certification body and far farm groups that are uh, interested in exploring this. Uh, obviously, considering current situation we're in, the timeline is to 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 be be confirmed. So, do stay on our on our mailing list if you're interested in being kept up to date on on this program, or just send us an email and responsible wall. And I will just finish up with our next steps. Uh, we are going to be busy on uh, supporting the implementation of the standards. Uh, we are, as I started the call with saying, so grateful for all the certified producers for all of their hard work. And we're really excited about welcoming a lot of new farmers into the standard with the uh, responsible mohair standard. And we want to do what we can to support them and connecting them to, to brands and retailers. We are working on a suite of tools and resources like quick guides, 
I anticipate we'll be doing a lot more webinars over the next few months. And we're also working on a series of case studies. We have got an open brand survey for the RWS that brands are invited to take part in. And if anyone has got any feedback at all or any, any requests, uh, please just send us an, an email at Responsible Wool. And that brings us to the end of the webinar and the top of the hour. I'm sorry we didn't get to the questions, but we will have um, made we will make note of all of them and we'll be answering them all in in writing as follow up so thank you very much for for your time and for for joining today's webinar and thank you to anna and peter for presenting thank you um, to all of you who did present and thank you hannah appreciate it as hannah mentioned that all of those questions that have been submitted will be answered via email and you will get those um, answers directly to your email address that you used to log into this webinar. Again, I'd like to remind all of you that um, those that participated and registered, um, and if you were not able to attend, will also be able to access this uh, via the recording that will be emailed out tomorrow. So thank you, and all of you have a blessed day. Bye-bye.